Our next presenter, who is going to talk about the sociological aspects about Judaism and science and religion and science, is Michael Zimmerman. Professor Michael Zimmerman is the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at the Evergreen State College in Washington. He received his PhD in ecology from, the Washington, Univer from Washington University in St. Louis after earning an AB degree in geography from the University of Chicago. So we've got some Chicago connections here too. As an ecologist, Michael's focused his attention on plant-animal interactions, particularly those associated with pollination. Michael also has a professional interest in science literacy in general and the evolution creation controversy in particular. He has conducted survey research of various groups, college students, high school teachers, school board presidents, managing editors of newspapers and elected officials, to determine how widespread the acceptance of pseudoscience actually is. As a newspaper columnist specializing on scientific and environmental issues, his work has regularly appeared in the op-eds of many newspapers nationwide, and he writes regularly for the Huffington Post. He has been elected a fellow of the, for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and is also a past editor of the newsletter of the Ohio Center for Science Education. Finally, he is the founder of the Clergy Letter Project, which I am a proud signatory of, and you should be as well. Um, it is an international organization of more than 15,000 religious leaders and scientists designed to demonstrate that religion and science are compatible and also founded Evolution Weekend, which is on Darwin's birthday to invite religious leaders to talk about science and religion. Um, and I think Jennifer was the first person I talked to about Sinai and synapses. I think Michael was the second person to be able to talk to. Uh, so he's also our, our advisory board. Uh, and so his expertise is really looking at the ground level of what happens in this question of science and religion. Uh, and he presented for us also for a public program a couple of years ago called Can Science and Religion Coexist? So please join with me in welcoming Professor Michael Zimmerman. Thank you, Jeff. What, what a pleasure and an honor to be, to be back and talking to, to this group. As everyone has said, uh, the projects that you've proposed are really thoughtful, engaging, at least to my mind, I think it's fair to say to all of our minds, and I'm sure to your congregations, and I hope beyond. Um, I have the really bad fortune of being the last speaker. <laughs> um, I've, you know, good actors say they hate sharing the stage with, with children and trained animals, and the speakers know that they never want to share the stage with people who are better speakers than they are. Um, so I apologize in advance. What I want to do in the little bit of time I have is not do any of the things Jeff said I was going to because <laughs> I'm a biologist, I'm an evolutionary biologist, I'm not a sociologist. Um, what I want to do is, is talk to you about how I came to this work, what I think this work is, and where I think we need to go collectively, or at least where some of us need to go, not everybody, clearly. As, as Jeff said, I'm a, I'm a biologist, I'm an evolutionary biologist by training, I'm an ecologist. I ended up getting involved in the creation evolution controversy which brought me to the, the battle lines, if you will, between religion and science, purely accidentally. I, was, I, I had no intention of doing that. I was very happy studying bumblebees. And they don't have a religion in science. <laughs> At least not that I know of. Um, but I ended up finding out about uh, basically Christian fundamentalists who were, who were trying to promote their view of religion and by promoting that, they were perverting the nature of science education in our public schools. I didn't. I had not. I did not know a thing about that as a high school student, as a college student, as a PhD student, and as a beginning uh, faculty member in a biology department at Oberlin College. I'd never heard of creationism. I didn't know there were there were people who just um, had these bizarre beliefs. When I found out, I was taken aback. I was surprised, and I was appalled. I didn't much care about the religious aspect, to be honest. I cared about the damage it was doing to science education. So I started talking and writing and, and speaking about how science education itself is important. How I, it was, in one sense, independent of religion. I was really worried that by promoting one particular view, one particular religious viewpoint, scientific education in American public schools was being perverted. I believed, and I still do believe, in the American democratic society that we all think we live in, and some days maybe we do, that 
if we were science, if we were creating uh, a culture and a generation or two of scientifically illiterate individuals, we were going to pay pretty serious consequences. That is, so many of our public decisions, so many of our public votes, whether we were making them or we were voting for people who were making scientific decisions, if they were being made based on, on Ill scientific illiteracy or just wrong-headed science information, we were going to be making terrible decisions. There was a real consequence for society, I believe. I put another way, I thought we really needed to be able to distinguish between, on one hand, science in the middle, non-science, and all the way on the other side, nonsense. And I believe there was a continuum. And in, unless we educated students about not the na not science itself, not everybody has to grow up to be a scientist, I believe, but everybody should have an understanding of what the scientific method is about. How science as a discipline is different from sociology or religion or history as a discipline. Unless we were doing that, we were going to embrace nonsense as much as we were going to embrace science. And that was dangerous, I thought, for society. I ended up recognizing that the issue became one of, of making sure people understood scientific methodology, the scientific method, how, how science is dependent upon a particular methodology. The creation evolution controversy became, for me, the touchstone of that. Not, again, not because I thought it was critical that everybody understand evolution or accept evolution. But when, when students were able to pick and choose what science they wanted, it meant they had no science. And that was really critical for me. So I ended up talking and writing a whole lot about it, about that issue. Um, and then, after a, a whole lot of time, um, an issue came up in, in the state of uh, was, uh, in the state of Wisconsin where I was living at the time, and there was a school district that was getting ready to um, put forward legislation that was going to be the most restrictive legislation in the country. That legislation <coughs> was going to demand that uh, a certain form of creationism be taught in public schools. People reached out to me and said, "Can you help?" And I, I tried to do some things to help. One of the things. I can do better than uh, I can do other things is, is write and organize. So I, I got people together to fight back um, with this group. What I, knew, what I was doing was getting scientists to fight, getting, religion, getting um, science teachers to fight back, getting anthropologists to fight back. But I knew what I really needed to do, which I didn't know how to do, was to get religious leaders involved. Because I knew from my previous work, if I as a scientist went into a school board and said, you're doing something wrong, and you're doing it wrong because your religion is, is a miss. No one would listen. And they weren't gonna listen for two reasons. First, because I was a scientist, not a religious leader, and second, because I was from out of town. So what I knew I had to do was get religious leaders, who were local, to stand up and say, not only is this terrible science and bad education, it is also bad religion. So what, what I ended up doing is having a friend of mine who is a UCC pastor write a two paragraph note, which became, what I will tell you is, is the clergy letter. And we circulated it through the state of Wisconsin, got 200 signatures pretty quickly, and um, it, it helped transform this local school district. After that, we moved this clergy letter, which basically, as I said, it's two paragraphs, it's very simple, it's designed for Christian clergy. It was written explicitly for Christian clergy. I didn't realize there was an issue beyond Christian clergy. And what it says is, the that there is nothing in modern science, there is nothing in evolutionary biology that runs afoul of our religious beliefs. Okay? That we as Christian clergy members, I'm using the we, I am not one of them. Um, we as Christian clergy members are fully accepting of modern evolutionary theory, and we believe it should be taught in public schools exclusively. That is the core tenet of, of uh, modern science. It, go, it concludes by saying something along the lines of um, religious truth is of a different order from scientific truth, but both are complementary. They both have something to bring to the table. I started circulating that. I was hoping for 10,000 clergy members nationally. When we started getting close, um, actually long before we started getting close, rabbis started writing to me, and they were annoyed. They were annoyed because the letter was for and from Christian clergy, and they couldn't sign it. And they said, what about us? And I said, I, what about you? <laughs> 
And I made it clear if, if a rabbi were to come forward and, and draft a letter, I would help circulate it, but I, 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 was, I was not a rabbi. I did not have a rabbinical voice. I could not write such a letter. Um, finally, after a couple of years, one did uh, from uh, Oak Park, in fact, Deerfield, Deerfield, uh, Ohio, David Oler. And we started circulating that. To this day, we have 14,300 or so Christian clergy members on our Christian letter. We have over 540 rabbis on our, on our um, rabbi letter. Why is all of that important? All of that is important for a couple of reasons. One is, we also have, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit, we have 400 um, Unitarian Universalists on a, uni, on a UU letter, they wanted to be involved. We have 25 Buddhists on a letter. We have a handful of Imams. Um, a whole different story of why we have so few Imams, and mostly it's my fault, not, it's not their fault. The issue is, is there a battle between religion and science. And people have talked about this before. The, the, the most important thing the clergy letter can do, the clergy letters can do, is to demonstrate, in fact, that there's not a, a battle between religion and science. There's a battle between religion and religion. There's a small group of people, fundamentalists in general, of all stripes, doesn't matter what religion, there are some fundamentalists of, in, in Judaism who are just as extreme about their science. They're a portion of their science who are willing to reject some of modern science. The goal of the clergy letters, the goal of, of scientists and religious leaders coming together is to demonstrate that religion of all, religious leaders of all stripes are all together agreeing that modern science has no negative impact on their, on their religious beliefs. And unfortunately, there are some religious leaders who feel differently. The scientists just happen to agree with one group of those religious leaders. So the battle is between a group of religious leaders, another group of religious leaders, and most of the scientists have lined up on one side. They've lined up on one side because the scientists understand, and Jennifer's uh, Perceptions Project disagrees to some extent with what I'm going to assert. But I like my assertion better than the data. I feel like Donald Trump is. <laughs> I believe that the vast majority of scientists understand that science is one of the few fields that self-bounds itself. That it says, within this box, we have a methodology that works very well. Outside of this box, our methodology is not appropriate. That science doesn't have a whole lot to say about aesthetics in, in many, many interesting ways. It doesn't have a whole lot to say about morality. It doesn't have a whole lot to say about um, some aspects of love. It doesn't have a whole lot to say about some aspects of spirituality. Within that box, within the box of materialistic naturalism, scientists say the natural world is all there is. That's all we can study. But if, once you move into the, the box of philosophical naturalism, you can extend beyond, if you will. You can extend beyond the, the realm of science. And there are really important questions that are open to scientists, that are open to humans, that scientific methodology does not touch. It's that difference, the difference between materialistic naturalism and philosophical naturalism that I think is so absolutely is so absolutely critical. We talked earlier, what, is it, what does truth mean? I think scientists bring, science searches for truth. The fascinating thing, the thing I love about being a scientist, as you search for truth, you never know when you find it. You have to be open to knowing that the world is going to give you some new data and some new experiments and some new ideas <coughs> that will demand that the truth be changed, that our perception of the world be changed. But that perception still means we, we're looking for a particular kind of truth. We cannot assert what that truth is. Religion brings to us a different kind of truth. Both of them are important in the human condition. And I think most good scientists recognize that the two can be complementary. They can be different, but they don't, they don't um, touch on one another directly. We, we talked earlier about the realm of, uh, what it, of <coughs> the human mind. One of the reasons a good number of religious leaders of the fundamentalist stripe, in a sense, don't like, or at least they say they don't like evolution. 
which is a touch point. You know, it's, it's, it's a flash point of science. It's not, you know, Jennifer, as we were talking earlier, has the good luxury of talking about the broad reach of science. Not, and the Clergy Letter Project really focuses on one narrow piece, evolution. But it's an important piece, because when you, do, when you throw out a piece you don't like, and you say, I don't like science, I don't like this part of science, you're throwing out a piece of methodology. And you don't have the luxury of throwing out that methodology. Some say, some of these fundamentalists say they don't like Darwinism because it leads to social Darwinism. And that's exactly where religion comes in. Science, does, science tells us perhaps where we came from, but not how we have to act. We have the ability to pick and choose our choices of action, our beliefs, but not our scientific beliefs. Our truth claims cannot go against those obvious facts of the natural world. But those truth claims don't have to extend beyond that. The last thing. I want to say two more things, I guess. Um, jumping around, trying to tie together some of the things that others have said. Jeff started, I think, early this morning by talking about the fact that individual stories are so important. And that's one of the reasons what, what you are doing is, is so very important. One of the things the Clergy Letter Project does, is, as Jeff mentioned, is we have a, an event each year called Evolution Weekend. It used to be Evolution Sunday. The first two years was Evolution Sunday. And both Jews and some Muslim leaders said, well, uh, Evolution Sunday, well, that doesn't help us. So we, we extend this Evolution Weekend to bring others involved. And the reason I know that Evolution Weekend has worked, and what Evolution Weekend is, is an opportunity for congregations all over the world to do something to advance the dialogue of the relationship between science and religion on one Sunday, one Saturday, one Friday. The reason I know it works is I've heard so many stories from congregants, from rabbis and ministers telling me about their congregants, saying, this, this one woman, for instance, um, came to the service. That she, was, she was begged to come. She hadn't been in, in, this, in church for 25 years because she was so frustrated by the nature of, of the, the church's view of science. She had tears in her eyes saying, had I known it could be like this, I would have been back 25 years ago. So one of the things I've learned from working in the Clergy Letter Project, working with thousands of, of religious leaders is, the, the battle between science and religion does really terrible things for science, we know that, but it also does really bad things for religion. What we end up doing is having religion defined as the norm being defined as the most extreme view of fundamentalists. That's how religion is. We need religious leaders, we need their congregations to take control of the definition of religion, to demonstrate that religion can be robust, and religion can be real, religion can, can interact well with the natural world, it can interact fully and productively with scientific knowledge, and there's no conflict there. Once we do that, we can transform the way the vast majority of people in our country under, come to understand both religion and science, and can come to an appreciation of both. The last thing I want to say is one of the reasons people move away from science is they're worried that once you understand the natural world, you lose something in, in, in its understanding. You've seen those pictures. Those pictures lead us to a greater understanding. But the, wor the word that Jennifer used and the word that I like to use a whole lot is awe. When you see those pictures, regardless of what you understand, I don't think you lose any of the awe that's in, embodied in the natural world around us. There are things about this world that, as a scientist, the, the few things I really understand well, I am typically in more awe of than I ever was before. So I think it's, it's, it's clear that Jewish leaders and Jewish uh, members of Jewish congregations, as Jennifer's data has shown, are more understanding and more accepting of science. But the issue isn't just those scientists and those in the congregations, it's extending the conversations beyond those scientists. And I think we all, as members of a democratic society, as individuals who care about both religion and science, we have an obligation to extend beyond our congregations to demonstrate that science and religion really can work hand in hand. Because when they do, we end up not allowing scientists to have the last word about public policy. The scientists shouldn't have the last word about public policy. They should inform public policy. Their science should inform public policy. But everybody else from other disciplines should have just as much to say about how we, how we utilize our science, how we implement our science. Not what science tells us, but the implications of that. And when we bring the, 
the world's religions together and say, all of us are comfortable with all aspects of science. Because science is just a way of knowing. It's just an understanding of the world around us. We are richer for it, and we are better able to make rational, informed decisions when we, when we come to that agreement and understanding. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And you did talk about the, the sociological pieces of this, because it really is about how do we how do we impact society and individuals? That it's that it's not abstract philosophical questions, but, but real 